Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. We'll start out today in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, we'll start with verse 32. This is where the Apostle Paul was saying farewell to the elders uh, from, I believe it was Ephesus, as he was going to speed on up to Jerusalem to be there by Pentecost. But he called the elders and he gave them this farewell. And part of this is what he says now. Acts 20, verse 32, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He says, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now what's interesting about this, brethren, is that if you look throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, not just the synoptics, but also John, you will find nowhere where Jesus is quoted as saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And yet the Apostle Paul himself knew that this is something he had said, and he assumed, assumed and knew that his listeners were aware of it as well. In fact, this particular saying of Jesus must have been so well known that he didn't need to cite when or where. And the Apostles... You know, the Apostle John wrote that if he was to write down everything Jesus said and did, they, the, the books, there wouldn't be enough room in the world to, for all the books. So, But this is something that was so well known that the Apostle Paul just assumed that everybody would, would know it. And at the time this teaching of Jesus was given, it took conventional wisdom and it turned it Upside down. And today, after 2,000 years of hearing this idea promoted by various churches, it doesn't sound quite as revolutionary as it once did. Now, our society may be familiar with the idea that it's more blessed to give than to receive, but that does not mean we actually live by it or practice it. For the most part, we still measure a person by how much they were able to sock away in the bank or how much authority or power they have or what kind of social status they achieve, what they were able to get or what flowed into them. And yet I think I mentioned this before, but a recent survey was taken of all the top billionaires, the, the richest men in the United States and ask them if they were content, if they were happy. The answer was a resounding no in almost all cases. You look at Jeff Bezos, who's recent, you know, he's divorced his wife of how many years and married a, a woman young enough to be his daughter. Bill Gates' marriage failed. All these men with all this money And still, they say, we made it to the top, but we can't see anything ahead. To say giving is better than getting indicates that the more important measure of a person is what flows out from them to others. Turn with me now to Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Here is something that 
is recorded is recorded that Jesus said in Luke 12 15 he says and he said to them take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions brethren covetousness is about focusing on what flows in rather than what flows out but let me ask you a question, and if you've ever thought about it. Why give us a commandment telling us not to covet stuff? How does me wishing I had my neighbor's big fancy house hurt anyone? If I were to murder my neighbor and take over his house, well, yeah, there's some harm in that. But we have commands covering murder and theft already. Right? Why prohibit covetingness? Well, the answer is, brethren, that the one harmed by coveting is us, is you, is me the one thinking the thoughts, and even if we never act on them. And this is how I intend to look at this today, brethren. Covetousness is a sin against the self. And it's interesting, as I've contemplated this, that covetousness was the last of the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, <coughs> given to Moses on Sinai. And it certainly doesn't mean that it was the least important. Because when you think about it, look how many sins, other sins, are directly related to covetousness. How many people murder for covetousness? How many people, well, stealing, obviously, is covetousness. How many people lie because they covet something? In fact, brethren, Covetousness was behind the very first sin. What do, we, what do we think of as the first sin that's recorded or that we know about from Scripture? Satan said, I will ascend to the, to the Most High. I will make my throne in the heavens. He coveted God's position. What was the second sin we have recorded? It's tied to that. Well, maybe not the second. I guess this was Eve coveting what she couldn't have, the knowledge of good and evil. And covetousness lies behind many, many sins. But the one thing that is so destructive of is our own character. You know, the first four of God's commandment breaks down what it means to love God and how to go about it. And the next five, of course, describe what it means to show love towards other human beings. The final commandment, as I said, gives us straight talk about how to love our own self, which is don't be materialistic. But I want to show us today, I want to examine today how covetousness is more than simply greed. It's more than simply greed or envy. So let's look at, let's look at the uh, definition of covetousness. Let's look, go first to the Old Testament. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. And we'll actually look at this in the list of the commandments. Exodus 20 verse 17. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version unless I tell you otherwise. Exodus 20 verse 17. <clears throat> You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now that word covet here in Exodus in the Hebrew is the word chamad. 
And kamad means to greatly deny, to greatly delight in. And actually, it's a neutral verb. What makes desire, this particular desire, good or bad depends on what it's directed toward. A person can greatly delight in good things as well as bad things. For example, you don't need to turn any of these, but I'll just give them. In Psalm 19, it says, The Lord's judgments are to be desired, delighted in, more than pure gold. That word, chamad, same thing as covet. Genesis 2.9, God caused every good tree that is desirable or delightful, chamad, to the eye, and good for food. So, we can be maybe a little bit surprised that chamad is mostly used in Scripture about desiring what is good or beautiful. Certainly nothing wrong with that. In older translations, such as the King James Version, King James Version, other Hebrew words with different meanings are also translated as covet or covetousness, so we, that gets a little into some confusion. For example, in Exodus 18.21. Exodus 18.21. says, Moreover, this is from the King James, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God. This is when, of course, Moses was going to get some help. <laughs> Men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Now that word covetousness, that's, it's, that's translated covetousness in the King James, is the word betza. And it means gain or profit. And it again is a value neutral verb, but it's almost always used in the context of gain which is the result of violence or deceit. Almost always. The, the New American Standard translate this as dishonest gain. Other translations, even in this verse, put it as bribery. These traditional translation practices have led to considering covetousness as excessive greed, obsessive longing for some object, greed, or envy. These are certainly examples of coveting. You know, make no mistake. But what the commandment simply says is do not desire or delight what others possess. Don't. So the commandment is addressing, in the essence, a, very, a, a much larger concept when we think about it. It's is simply about desire. Let's look at Romans. Let's go to the New Testament now. And we'll look at Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Romans 7, verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not, had not said, you shall not covet. And go to chapter 13 in Romans. While we're in Romans, and look at verse 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, the Greek word for, that's translated covet is epithumio. Epithumio, rather, epithumio. And it, again, is a value-neutral verb. It can be directed towards both good or bad. And it's translated in other places as coveted, craved, desire, desired, gladly long or uh, longing. It's also translated as lust or sets its desire. 
Epithumio is also seen in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Let's look at that. Uh, no, it's actually a synonym. In, 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 excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, a synonym of epithumio is used. As you know, synonym is a, a word with the same meaning. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And that word there translated as desire is a, a cognate or a, a, a synonym of epithumio, and it is z zilu. Zilu. And it can mean earnestly desire, same as epithumio. Earnestly seek, earnestly desire, be envious, or just simply seek. So when it comes to the Tenth Commandment, brethren, desire is not what causes you harm. This, we can desire good things. We can desire bad things. It's not desire. It's directing that desire towards the wrong things is what causes us harm. There's a variety of Greek words that indicate greedy desire, love of money, reaching out to grab something that are translated as covetousness. These are all forms of covetousness, but the commandment itself is broader. So let's go back to the, let's go back to the commandment. Let's go back to Exodus 20 for a minute, and we'll see what we aren't to desire. Exodus 20, 17, you shall not covet or desire your neighbor's house. You shall not covet or desire your neighbor's wife you shall, or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, notice that all the examples in this commandment are relevant to agricultural and village life. Not so much in the 21st century. I, I doubt very much that Ray has desired his neighbor's donkey. Maybe his tractor. <laughs> but, but if we consider these examples as typifying categories of stuff, we can see that they're very applicable. For example, the house. You shall, not, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. Well, that's his property, homes, luxury goods, furnishings, anything to do with his home. Wife, of course, that covers sex life, but also family or social status. Servants, economic status, high-paying job, excellent, exciting career that your neighbor may have. You may desire that. Donkey. Of course, tools of wealth, their education, their business, tow truck, tractor. These categories are as relevant today as they were when they were given at Mount Sinai. And these are the types of things that the command tells you not to set your heart upon. There isn't much that isn't covered by these categories, brethren. So, but what, let me ask this then. What is wrong with desiring these? Well, in these cases, we just talked, they belong to another. As, previous, as I said earlier, acting upon the desire and taking them from the other person is already covered by the other commandments. Don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery. But just simply wanting or desiring what your neighbor or what your friend has is not good for you. It is not good. Because they are not valid measures of self-worth. You're wanting these because you perhaps feel some lack of self-worth. It's harmful to measure our success in life by comparing ourselves to others. 
especially in regard to material wealth and status. It's a false measure, and God says in no uncertain terms, don't do it. Don't do it. It's harmful to your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Things are appealing. They satisfy the senses. They give a sense of fulfillment. They build up our feelings of self-worth. But that satisfaction, that fulfillment, and self-esteem that they are offering is not lasting. Again, I reference Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. The initial glow of happiness soon wears off, and we set off in search of more to get the buzz back like an addict. From the, Bibli from the Bible's perspective, from Scripture's perspective, brethren, things are only tools used along the way to build, or not build, godly character. And here's a little something to think about. Godly character is all that we get to take us into the resurrection. Establishing your ideas of worth or happiness on material objects is exceedingly short-sighted. Because this is all going to go away, brethren. All your stuff will disappear when you enter the grave, given to another and will not be returned to you when you're resurrected. Let's look, look at what Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. 16. Luke 12, 16. It's a parable, one of Jesus' parables. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tell down my barns and build larger ones. There I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. All that you have accumulated in life, brethren, won't be worth a hill of beans after you're gone to you. Whereas the fruits of the Spirit, righteous character, will pass through death and the resurrection and will be with you forever and ever. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is why these are, the, these are the possessions to set your heart upon. These are the things... We should be coveting. So let me give you an antidote to covetousness. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. Philippians 4 11 not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, consider, brethren, that Paul wrote this while he was in prison for preaching the truth of the gospel and causing uproar in the cities of the empire. Paul had his down days. 2 Corinthians, he goes through the list of all the things he had suffered. Things you and I, I know, have not suffered up to now. and I don't know what the future lies, but it would be hard to match the Apostle Paul, who was in perils after perils, left for dead, in perils of the sea, beaten, thrown out of city after city, and imprisoned. Not once, but twice. But he was content. What did Paul have to be happy about? Well, he had the the contentment of of the glory of a life well lived. He had the contentment that he had always given God glory and done his will. He had the contentment that he had lived with great zeal for preaching the truth. And he had, at the end, he had the contentment to honestly say, I have fought the good fight. You see, Paul had been investing in his life. He had been investing in eternity. Matthew 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All the things you need. You know, God knows. He says, Scripture tells us God knows what we need. And he will add these to us if we seek first his kingdom. He will see what we, he he will provide for us. It may not be all that we want, but we'll get what we need, and usually with a little extra. So now let's look at some steps to overcoming covetousness. The first step is to love and obey God. You know, sadly, the love of money can push God right out of our thoughts and out of our actions, which is why elsewhere it's equated with idolatry. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world And we cannot take anything out of the world except character. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is spread through this craving, it is through this craving rather that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And that's sad, but it's happened. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue, covet, <laughs> righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness gentleness again I say brethren our stuff won't be waiting when we're resurrected but your father your father your creator will be and he will be filled with love and gladness to see us there so love and obey God number two have faith and confidence in God faith and confidence not just love him and obey him, but have faith in God. Let's look at the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, verse 26. Hebrews 11, verse 26. 
<coughs> the faith chapter here, we're talking about Moses. Hebrews 11, verse 26. He, Moses, considered the reproach of Christ greater than wealth, greater wealth rather than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. He had the faith in that reward. How do we know this? Go up to, to verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and, and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, that's what Moses, Moses had that faith. He knew there was a God. And he knew that there was a reward waiting for him that was greater than the treasures of Egypt. Psalm 60, 16. Let's go to Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And in your right hand are pleasures evermore. Think ahead, brethren. Try, if you can, to picture in your mind or wrap your mind around all the experiences and joys that will be available to us if we possess eternal life. All that we will see, all that we will do with an active role in ruling along with our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ in the family of God. Leading, teaching, expanding the boundaries of the universe itself. What, on, what material thing on earth today is worth all that? So, Love and obey God. Have faith and confidence in God and his promises. And third, practice generosity. Jesus did, said, he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We practice generosity. We get engaged with our time, our money, our attention. James 1, verse 27. James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Spend time with people who don't have much. It will change you. You know, one of the feasts I'll remember the most for many reasons is back in the days of Worldwide, we went to Jamaica. And that year, they had, had changed it. They usually had it up in uh, Montego Bay or Ocho Rios or somewhere in the north of the island. But that year was right after a hurricane. And uh, it changed a lot. Of, a lot of people were particularly had lost a lot due to the destruction. And they didn't have much funds. And so to make it easier for the population there in Jamaica, they had it in Kingston. We went to Kingston. In Kingston, you saw a real dichotomy. There were those who lived up on the hill that lived in fine houses. All, of course, was fenced off, you know. Most of these were probably politicians. <laughs> but the common people lived... And we saw such poverty in, that you could not imagine. People out actually bathing in the uh, drainage, uh, I don't know what, like canals or something there. Armed guards in the Burger King to keep out undesirables, I guess. But let me tell you something, brethren. These people, they didn't have much. But the brethren there, who did not have much, gave us more with what they had. And they were more joyful 
<laughs> I mean, you went to a you went to this to a, a service there during the Feast of Tabernacles, and those people were joyful. They were singing. They and the ser- you you know, their uh, services might go well over two hours because they were just they were just so. Joyful. It just, it was amazing. And I tell you, it did change the way that I, you know, it changed me. It changed, I think, all of our family to see these people who, the, what we measure wealth, had very little, but they were rich. They were rich in what counts. So spend time with people who don't have much, and it will change you, especially if, you know, around godly people who don't have much. People who practice godly virtues tend to get ahead in life. And sometimes that's because God himself supernaturally intervenes and materially blesses a person, but I think that's rare. But followers of God's vir- godly virtues do well mostly because the laws of God are in sync with reality, and they work. God's people aren't usually fabulously wealthy, but neither are they destitute. They usually have what they need with a little left over to spare. And this is what God wants, because it puts us in a position to use that extra you have, and then the process develop the godly mindset of generosity, love, Faith and generosity are the antidote to the spirit of covetousness. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. And you think, you ask these people with the billions of dollars, you know, you have enough? No, not yet. Need that next million. Solomon says it's vanity, chasing after the wind. Covetousness and the desire to acquire possessions is never satisfied, never content, never happy. This commandment, not to covet, not to desire what isn't ours, is for our own good. The covetous spirit will always want just one more thing. And when they have it, they will just want one more thing. And just a little bit more until all that is left is his desire the throne of God. If we allow ourselves to measure our self-worth by comparing ourselves with others, we will always find somebody slightly more up than us. There's only enough room at the top for one, and when you get right up there next to whoever is on top, the covetous spirits will want us to top that as well until all that's left is to be greater than God. So we make, covetous can, makes us, can, can you see, makes us make ourselves our own God. The creator of humanity wants to give you everlasting life, but he does not want you to bring the spirit of covetousness into eternity. Unlike this, our stuff, and possessions, which do not come with you. Our spiritual makeup does come with us. The plan for eternity is joy, justice, peace. Desire for what others have is not compatible, brethren. It is simply not compatible with the future that God has mapped out. Let's look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Start with verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, 
that your passions are at war within you. You desire. You covet. (laughs) And do not have. So you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Brethren, God simply will not allow that attitude into his kingdom. Those who reign, who, those who will reign with Christ at his return will have done battle with all forms of sin. And in so doing, we will learn the basics of eternal life. This will include learning to exercise control over what we desire and what we set our hearts on. The inheritance is prepared for you and for me. And that is that together with Christ, we will possess all things. Not in a spirit of covetousness, but as in a spirit of outflowing generosity, concern for others, joy, and love. So I say to you, brethren, beware of covetousness.